have in the recent times. So I gave a version of this talk earlier for those of you that have heard it, uh, you're welcome to um, uh, tune into the areas that may be new to you. Uh, and for others, uh, feel free to ask questions, I suppose, at the end of the uh, talk. So I'm coming from the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, so nano and nanotechnology, nanomaterials is actually one of the major uh, themes of excellence at the university. So we have dozens of professors working on nanotechnology. For example, the invention of uh, the CVD growth of graphene, which I'll talk about uh, as we move along, uh, was uh, done at uh, the University of Texas. Uh, this is now a wide, um, uh, broadly adopted uh, all over the world for growing graphene by my uh, colleague, uh, Rod Ruoff, and co-workers. Uh, uh, graphene supercapacitors, the most cited work, uh, uh, was also pioneered here that led to a startup company. So the University of Texas actually has the largest portfolio of patents, according to uh, the BBC analysis uh, of uh, um, graphene and 2D materials related work. So uh, a lot of activity. Uh, I welcome you to visit when you have a chance. Uh, many pioneers, uh, uh, research pioneers at the university, so I just show a few of them, but there are dozens actually. Uh, Steven Weinberg uh, is a pioneer in the standard model of physics, which uh, we now learn, uh, we all learn in high school physics. Um, uh, and then John Goodenough uh, just recently got the Nobel Prize for lithium ion batteries. Uh, and he's still very active, even though he's, he's 97 years old. So he's sometimes called the oldest innovator, uh, a very wonderful colleague. And Grant Wilson is a, um, the pioneer for the photoresist used uh, in the trillion dollar uh, microelectronics business. So in my research lab, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, very multidisciplinary. We start from the bottoms uh, and go up. So from nanomaterials, so we're, we work on the synthesis and growth of these materials. And then we look uh, for applications mostly. We, uh, focused our effort on uh, electronic type applications, but then from time to time, we also um, conduct uh, nanoscience uh, when we discover new phenomena. So I'll speak about one of those new phenomena uh, uh, later today. So let me use a few slides just to introduce nanotechnology to the broader audience. I know there are already many experts uh, listening to this. So nanotechnology is technology related to uh, uh, feature sizes that are within one nanometer to about a hundred nanometer. So within this scale, you're talking about very small uh, um, molecules like glucose, all the way to viruses. You know, for example, the coronavirus. Uh, some it's about a hundred nanometers, a few hundred nanometers. And so you can put that in perspective, looking at other. Uh, uh, size uh, uh, features like blood cells uh, uh, of the order of uh, 10,000 10, nanometers, uh, bacteria and microscopic features are much larger. So typically when you restrict yourself to the nanoscale, uh, a lot of materials begin to show unique phenomena they do not show in their bulk uh, uh, length scales. So one of the biggest uh, examples I, I can share with you about the power of uh, nanoscale and nanotechnology is uh, computing. So if you look at uh, uh, 1975 or so, uh, supercomputers occupied almost a room, cost millions of dollars, and still at the end of the day, uh, had relatively limited uh, computing capacity while weighing a huge uh, 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 tons of weight. But now, fast forward to a few decades later, uh, courtesy of miniaturization, uh, for example, you know, the iPhone or the Samsung, this is, these are not even the latest models, but you can see that they have 20 times more speed, orders of magnitude, reduction in power, price and weight, and they can deliver more computing power at your fingertips than what a supercomputer can do, could do uh, a few decades earlier. So that is one perfect example of miniaturization. And there are other many, many promising um, examples from catalysis to energy storage, to filtration, uh, to environmental applications that are all benefiting from 
uh, the capability to scale uh, uh, phenomena or, or materials to smaller dimensions. So with that very brief introduction, let me now move on to nanomaterials, which uh, lie at the heart of nanotechnology. So materials in general can be categorized from zero dimensional materials uh, like uh, particles, one dimensional materials like rods, films are two dimensional materials. And a lot of the materials that we encounter in everyday life are bulk materials. These are three dimensional materials. And so nanotechnology, we're often talking about 2D or 1D and 0D. And a, a good element that illustrates the dimensionality available in nature is carbon. So we see, for example, in carbon, you have the bulk base of carbon, which is diamond or, or graphite. Uh, so that has its own unique properties. And then you have the film phase of carbon, which is graphene, a single sheet of uh, honeycomb uh, carbon atoms. And then you have nanotubes, which are one dimensional, and then you have buckyballs that are zero dimension. So for those students in the audience looking for areas of research, carbon is a very, very uh, uh, exciting element uh, because it hosts a, a wide variety of phenomena across its length scales. So I'm going to be mostly talking about films uh, in this work. So graphene is an example of a two dimensional film and there's a lot of uh, activity in the last 15 years. So let me uh, use this slide just to define what these two dimensional materials are. So we consider them a layered crystalline structure uh, so that they have an isotropic bonding and this is the key feature. So that means within the plane, they're very strong. They have covalent bonding in the plane, but out of the plane in the Z direction, they're very weak. So a very good example of that is graphite. Uh, think of it as a stack of paper. You can peel each sheet of the carbon paper from the stack. And when you peel one sheet, you get graphene. Uh, so graphene is very strong, but uh, in the Z direction, it's easy to peel off material. So this is the thinnest um, conductive material in the world. And then there are other examples like HBN, which is a thinnest insulator. That's a honeycomb of boron and nitrogen atoms. And then we have a, a molybdenite a mineral. And you can also peel up one layer. It forms a more complex sandwich structure. And there are hundreds or thousands, uh, depending on who you speak to now and your definition, there could be thousands of this layered material. So an abundant area really of research activity, innovation, and uh, a lot of effort towards uh, enabling new industries uh, that will benefit society. And you can see this illustrated, for example, in this uh, publication count uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, you see there's a dramatic increase in the number of uh, peer reviewed publications in this field. Uh, uh, now you have uh, more than 20,000 publications uh, uh, per, year, uh, per year. So translating to um, 60 papers per day. So even within the period of this conference, there'll be hundreds of new papers published in this field. So what have we learned so far, for example, for graphene and related materials? So graphene is the best known electrical conductor, much more conductive than the copper that we use in uh, um, uh, semiconductor technology. Uh, it's best known thermal conductor, so a lot of applications in heat spreading. Uh, for example, uh, it's now being used in the uh, packaging of uh, the smartphones to spread the heat at the back. Uh, the strongest mechanical material, and you see some examples of talks uh, within this conference, very large strength to weight ratio, large surface to volume ratio, that's very important for sensors, and one of the most optically transparent materials. So there are already a lot of, um, uh, several industries have introduced this as a transparent conductive film. So billions of dollars have been invested in the past 10 years. And the hope is that will convert the scientific value of these materials to technological and economical applications. So let me give some examples of some of the work we have done in my lab in the last uh, 10 years or so. So we started working on the growth of graphene uh, about 10 years ago. And so we developed a method of growing this uh, based on previous work by my colleague, Rob Ruoff, uh, where we could grow this on um, uh, catalytic copper films on silicon wafers. So the main uh, innovation here was uh, we needed to control the microstructure so that we can grow these crystalline materials by chemical vapor deposition 
on a, a, a relatively uh, nanocrystalline catalytic copper film, which was not achieved before, on a silicon-based wafer. Because if you could do it on a silicon-based wafer, perhaps that will make it uh, compatible with uh, semiconductor technology. So uh, we're able to scale this, uh, we're successful in this, and scale this from uh, 100 millimeter or four inch wafers to uh, ultimately 12 inch wafers in partnership with Extron. Extron is a leading carbon uh, equipment company. And so this partnership is translated into a recipe. And this uh, recipe uh, is now uh, available buy the equipment as a commercial uh, method. There are also other methods of growing graphene, uh, of um, obtaining graphene, and one can obtain it from the ground. Uh, several countries in the world have deposits of graphite uh, from their mines, and this can be, you know, prepared almost uh, as a smoothie, and then uh, in a blender to, to make a liquid uh, version, and this liquid version in the blender uh, through sonication will share this graphite and create graphene. And then you could have this graphene slurry. So many, many companies, you can just Google this on the internet. You see many companies are selling this uh, liquid phase uh, exfoliated graphene, and they've done the same with other 2D materials. And with this liquid phase forms, there are many ways to deposit this material on your uh, application platform. So deep coating uh, of a sample in the liquid, blade coating, for more uniform co coverage, inject printing for lower cost uh, manufacturing, and even spray coating where you don't, uh, uh, you're not too concerned about feature sizes. So a very uh, uh, widely um, uh, uh, useful methods. And I think uh, 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 the speaker yesterday uh, may have talked about some of this. And so some examples of this graphite materials or graphene materials are in making membranes. So Water filtration is a, a universal problem in many parts of the world. So this, I'm not going to show this video, but you can see it on YouTube or Google it on YouTube. And in that um, video, uh, you see, you know, polluted water being passed through this membrane to obtain drinking water. And in that video, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, subject actually drinks the, uh, the clean water. So this is already uh, uh, available technology today. Uh, another another uh, example, for example, we're working on ELF. So we're working on diagnostic sensors for the coronavirus. Uh, as you all know, this is a global public health issue and we're using graphene as a diagnostic sensor. So in this work, uh, graphene is a sensor, it's very sensitive to everything. So what we're doing is then you functionalize it with the antibody of the uh, coronavirus. So these are already available because you can even get them commercially. These antibodies make it extremely selective and bind to the coronavirus. So if you take a sample from a saliva or from a nasal swab, uh, that binding will register as a distinct change in the electrical uh, uh, resistance or impedance of the material. And then this way you can detect the presence of the virus uh, using the same platform, which we developed earlier uh, for something else. Uh, you can also use the antibodies uh, related to the flu and those will bind to the flu virus. So with this platform, you could do dual detection, which would be a very important issue uh, in the winter in many countries because the coronavirus and the flu will coexist together. So now we're now developing this as a USB type uh, point of contact uh, sensor that people can use at home, uh, one time use disposable to get themselves uh, self diagnostics. So with those examples uh, behind us, uh, I'll now give uh, some research highlights of two specific works in our, in our lab in the last couple of years. So one will be the graphene electronic tattoo some of you may have already seen this uh, in my previous talks. And really the idea, the basic uh, discovery a hundred years ago was that the human body is an electrical machine. So what does that mean? That means if you place electrodes on any part of the human skin, you can measure potential uh, and you can even register a current. And that's because uh, the human body 
uh, is full of ions. Um, so we're not a superconductor and we're not an insulator. So we have ionic particles flowing uh, all over the body. So that, you know, that means you can measure voltage and current. So if you put these electrodes on the head, you can measure what is known as the EEG. That relates to brain health, seizures, mental health. If you put them on the chest, um, that relates to cardiac activity and the health of the heart. Some of you already have experienced this in clinical settings. So as you can tell, these are very, very uh, restrictive. They're not mobile uh, uh, and you cannot definitely take them out of the hospital. So about 10 years ago, uh, one of my colleagues uh, at uh, Illinois, uh, John Rogers and uh, co-worker Nan Shulu, who is a colleague at UT Austin, they realized that since the human body is an electrical machine, all you really need is conductive material on the skin. It doesn't necessarily have to be these big, massive wires um, uh, like a TV cable. Uh, you could just use thin films of metal. And if you can uh, mechanically match the thin films of metal onto the soft platform of the skin, you should be able to obtain the same electrical recordings you got uh, in, in these big wires. So that led to this, film, this area of metal uh, tattoo electronics. Uh, these are light, this, the, you know, portable. So, so now we can talk about mobile health uh, because this can be connected to, let's say, a mobile phone to obtain the recordings. So I started thinking about this myself a few years ago, and I said, well, if all you need is conductive material on the skin, then it should be enough that uh, graphene, which is the thinnest material, and there's a value to having a thin material, because when you have a thin material, it can match better mechanically to the skin uh, and last longer, uh, then graphene should be able to do the same job. And this is in fact what we started working on and we have now demonstrated uh, in the past couple of years, uh, graphene tattoos. These are the thinnest tattoos uh, in the world and they conform perfectly to the skin without the use of any adhesive. Uh, so when you use metal thin films, you need an adhesive tape to secure it. Graphene doesn't require any adhesive tape, and it's also optically transparent and mechanically imperceptible. So when we say imperceptible, that means you cannot feel it when it's on your skin. So this has led to another area of uh, mobile health. And so there are many applications. I already mentioned mobile health monitoring, but you can also imagine human machine interfaces. I'll show an example of that, I think, then athletics and even fashion. So we've now advanced this uh, graphene tattoo technology to a point in which uh, even high school students can come to our lab and do this. And so we make the graphene tattoo uh, on a tattoo paper, and then we use a water release, uh, uh, releasable layer to transfer the pattern from the tattoo paper, which is this white backing onto the skin. So it's very similar to technology that uh, you will find uh, in the mall when you know, people go and get a temporary tattoo. It's very breathable, very stretchable, uh, and it lasts for several days on the skin, uh, according to uh, measurements. So when you do something for, uh, that is related to health, you always have to benchmark against existing standards. So uh, I won't go, for the sake of time, I won't go into the details of all of these measurements. I will suffice it to say that uh, we've done ECG, which is uh, the electrical signals related to the heart, and uh, the graphene here, the black uh, uh, data, so it's comparable to the commercial. We've done EMG, which is the electrical signal related to the muscle activity, so the graphene actually has better signal-to-noise ratio than commercial uh, technology. And we've done like uh, uh, physiological measurements as well, such as temperature, we can measure the skin temperature, hydration, that's very important for athletics, uh, uh, for performance, and other kinds of measurements uh, as well. So this is an example of an integrated system. It's not very elegant, but it's our first prototype. And so the graphene tattoos, you can barely see it. Uh, so those are at the very bottom uh, of the chest of the subject, uh, in this case, the model. And then we have this uh, hybrid connection to a chip. Uh, so that's why I said it's not very elegant, but it works at the moment. Um, this is for athletic use. Uh, or performance. And so on a smartphone or smart tablet, one can uh, collect the recordings uh, related to the cardiac activity uh, when this person, for example, is doing exercise. 
So the goal now is to make all of this in one flexible substrate so it to be very streamlined. And so there are actually many opportunities for graphene and 2D materials in health monitoring. Again, uh, for students in the audience, you may find this interesting area uh, to begin research. So uh, all the way from invasive to non-invasive, from top to bottom, from the brain health, all the way to gestures, kinematic sensors, biochemical sensors, physical sensors, electrical sensors, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So those interested can read a review article. I can post this later as well. So for the sake of time, I'll move on to the last topic of my, um, of a research highlight in my lab, and this is on memory uh, technology. So uh, sometimes they're called memoristas. I must uh, emphasize first that uh, memory is the most important component in semiconductor technology today. So this, to a large extent, defines, for example, how much you pay for your smartphone. Right? You know, if you have uh, 256 gigabytes or 512 gigabytes, you're going to pay much more for the higher memory. So memory is the most important and the driving component in semiconductor technology. So for memristors, these two terminal devices, they're actually relatively easy to understand. So it's an application of defect. And what you have is a top electrode uh, insulator and a bottom electrode. We like to say that these are metal insulator, metal kind of structures. And when you try to measure the current uh, through such a structure vertically, you see there's no current flowing because the inside is an insulator. So what happens is when you apply high voltage, it's very similar to lightning. Uh, you know, uh, the top electrode, you can think of it as the sky, the bottom electrode as the ground, and the insulator as air. And so, of course, there's no current flowing in air in normal conditions, but when you have a high electric field like lightning, current begins to flow. So the same thing in the solid state, uh, the nanoscale phenomena, when you apply high voltage, there's ionization of the dielectric or the insulator, and then current begins to flow, and that means you have a different uh, resistance. So we say this is a on state of the memory and this is the off state, so that represents the binary states of information. And then you can repeat this cycle nowadays millions and in some cases billions of times. So we said, well, maybe 2D materials can uh, enable uh, advanced memory uh, technology because you can make the entire sandwich construction from 2D materials, including metals, semiconductors, and dielectrics. And if you can do that uh, for an atomically thin film, you get these benefits which are highly desirable from a performance point of view. It's higher density, so in the same form factor, you can get higher memory storage. It's forming free. I won't speak too much about that, but that's very important uh, from a technological point of view. It's smarter, what we mean, it's a lower energy. So again, thinking about battery life, that's very important and it's faster. So when your pictures have to load up, you rather them load up instantaneously rather than experience a delay. So all of this is very important also for the consumer experience. So when we started working on this, a lot of people believe that it was not possible to use 2D materials to make uh, memristors. Um, so indeed, we showed uh, after six months of our initial work, we showed the first memristors. We call them atomristors, which are memristors in atomically thin film. And this is a standard bipolar memory effect. Uh, you see there's very low current um, at the bottom of this graph. We see that's the high resistance state then we apply a very high electric field around one volt, and then it goes to very high currents, and then we'll say that's a low resistance state, and we can reset it back when we apply negative voltage and the, vol the curve goes back down. So very repeatable process. Uh, we say it's non-volatile, so that's very important for memory technology. Non-volatile -vol means that if you leave it, for example, in the low resistance state, the on state, you turn off the power, it stays in that state. It doesn't change. Unlike transistors, for example, transistors, you need to apply the voltage uh, and the current all the time to get that operation. So in memory, you can turn off the power and it remains there. That's how your pictures stay where they are, even though your, your, your phone power may be turned off. So we've been able to demonstrate this memory from many materials grown in different ways. And now uh, in the past couple of uh, one or two years, We've been focusing on the mechanism. So initially, we didn't really understand the mechanism. We just observed the phenomena. So after a lot of uh, advanced experiments uh, using scanning tunnel microscopy, first principle simulations, we finally now understand the mechanism. 
So the mechanism is as follows. So you have, uh, for example, in this case, MOS2, which is a 2D semiconductor. Uh, so this material is non-conducting initially. So when you pass current vertically, current is zero. Uh, it has a defect. I'll just illustrate that as this red uh, uh, circle. And then you have a metal, this could be gold. So what happens is when you apply a high voltage, uh, then the gold metal can now uh, diffuse and get absorbed into the uh, uh, defect. This defect is a sulfur vacancy. It's an empty state. So when this gold now gets into this sulfur vacancy, then the current turns, uh, 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 the, it's basically shorted, and then you get very high current. And so that represents a memory off a memory on states. So I think my time is coming up. Let me try and wrap up. So uh, there's actually a lot of uh, uh, device components that can be made from 2D materials for memory technology. I've really only spoken about the uh, so-called metal insulator, metal memorista, but you know it can also be 2D materials can also be used in 3D memory, in phase change, which is based on heat memory, in flash memory, which is uh, charge storage, uh, uh, and other kinds of memory, including spin-based memory. So again, very rich field for those looking for new avenues for research innovation. And you can read more about this in our recent paper. So I would just like to just talk lastly, one or two slides on the importance of education and development of human capacity. Uh, and so this is something that's very important, I think, for innovation is uh, traditionally, we've mostly focused on scientific and engineering courses. But I think very important nowadays is also to emphasize entrepreneurial training to students so that they can take ideas from the lab towards discovery, towards startups, towards industry. So I wrote this article that in this spirit, when you have an entrepreneurial element to the education, it's very important to not only recognize the important aspects such as research and discovery, but to also embrace that failure is an inevitable part of the journey. And this failure is what sometimes help us learn and to rediscover things that we may otherwise ignore. So failure is an option and very important for innovation. And then since this is an international uh, virtual conference, I think uh, it's also important to highlight that nanotechnology, which is a field I am involved in, uh, really requires multi party collaboration, uh, not just between faculty and industry, but also international collaborations to bring expertise. And uh, no doubt government support is critical to catalyze and fertilize ideas uh, to make it to application. So this is my last slide and I would like to use this opportunity to welcome any questions uh, as well. Yeah, thank you, Reggie. It's uh, it is really informative and eye-catching. Uh